I play martial arts for my hand and I crack it, going to 19, getting Tundra. Use Tundra, white mana, Esper Sentinel. My opponent pitches Brainstorm, paying one life to force of will my Esper Sentinel. I will daze. I'll put the Tundra back into my hand as the alternative casting cost. Vince, what are you doing? Uh, oh, um, I'm playing mental magic. It's just like normal magic, but you have the deck list in your mind. Mental magic? Don't you normally need someone to play that with? Yes, but I don't really have anyone to play with. Don't have anyone? What are you talking about? I'm right here. Yeah, but I don't know if it's going to be right for you, Brian, because you do need a sharp young mind to play. <laughs> Balderdash, I am a connoisseur of all magic formats. Do you think me some doltish ignoramus? An antiquated crackpot? Well, you are talking like a 19th century villain. Oh, come on. I was immersed in some literature here. Give me a chance. All right, okay, okay. Let's begin. Play Flooded Strand from my hand. Crack again, going to 19 life. Eh, wait, wait, wait. What, what's wrong? We haven't decided who's going first. Okay, fair enough. Would you like to... Heads or tails? I'm sorry, what? Well, I flipped the coin in my head. Heads or tails? No, 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 no. You do not flip mental coins to determine who's going first in mental magic, Brian. Oh, I see. Well, in that case, I just rolled a 20. What did you roll? No, none of that either. No coin flips, no mental die rolls. We either do that in the real space, or we just take it in turns with who goes first. Okay, okay, geez. You can go first if it matters so much to you. It doesn't matter. Let's begin. Flooded Strand. Go to 19, cracking it, fetching up Tundra, and I'll use Tundra to cast. Judge! What are, you, what are you doing? You didn't shuffle your deck, let alone let me cut it. How do I know you didn't look at the top card or stack it? No, Brian, that's the point. There is no shuffling. The deck is always stacked. You're always drawing what you need. It's about the memory and the tactics. Oh, so you admit to stacking. Well, I can't wait to see what the mental judge has to say to this. Good luck trying to redeem your mental prize points at my mental mental prize wall, Mr. So-called Pleasant Kenobi. Vince? Vince? Ha! Huh. Salty opponents storming off after being correctly accused of cheating? Wow, this is just like a game of real magic. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Dies to Removal. In today's episode, myself and my co-host Brian here, even though we are on your channel, Brian, today we're going to talk about banned versus boring, banality versus the brutality towards older formats. Would you rather things be the same all the time or upshifted and upended constantly in addition to bans? In other words, which is better? A Magic the Gathering set where there are a lot of broken cards that will need to be banned, things are uh, mismatched in terms of power, but the set overall is really great, really exciting, really flavorful, or a perfectly precisely balanced set with no offending players, but also maybe is kind of lukewarm at best. What, are, what, what, what do we want? Because both have their problems. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've seen it in recent time, and this is what we're gonna go into, right? almost like a case study of sorts, where some sets are extreme in that they have left a lasting footprint on all of magic that can almost not be undone without complete sweeping bans versus other sets where uh, <laughs> you kind of forget they existed. And some of these sets, if you remove the cards that were banned, you also forget they existed. Especially so. And to do this, we're looking, we're gonna start by looking at Throne of Eldraine, which is a set that had a lot of pushed power cards and a lot of bands, but also, in retrospective, is a set that is very memorable and probably very much enjoyed by the player yep. base despite those issues. That doesn't mean the people enjoyed those issues. You can be very upset about Oko and still very fond of Throne of Eldraine. We are capable of such complexity. I guess we can address that issue here, because I was saying when Throne was around that I liked the set a lot, but obviously the focus was entirely upon um, Once Upon a Time, Oko, and all the cards that were dominating formats, getting banned and stuff like that. And it kind of dominates the conversation. And then as a community, we do focus on the negative, which is the, the power level push. Well, when we do an episode called uh, uh, Why Such and Such Set is Failing or Format is Failing, yeah. it, it gets huge views. And when we do a video called Why We Love Legacy or Why Modern is in a Better Place Than It's Ever Been, we get very lukewarm views because in a way, you don't exactly go out and protest with signs that say everything is fine, we're very happy. Yeah. You just go about your life, but then when there are problems, that's when you break out the signs. And that is just a symptom of the discourse. So this episode is good in that there are things I love about 
Throne of Eldraine, and the set that we're going to compare it to, the set that came out about one year later, Zendikar Rising, and then to compare to the set that's coming out as we speak, Innistrad Crimson Vow, which is also about one year later. And I think we see a definite downshift in power. Well, you're going to see some hot takes from us because we're going to have to say whether or not we think something Crimson Vow is broken enough to be banned or and all we're going to say it's not now. And then so in two weeks time might get banned from a format that we completely missed. So you get that hot, spicy interaction of content as well. Yeah, Vince is going <laughs> to name specific cards, which I, of course, wisely will avoid doing. And so then we can all point to the fact that Vince did not know what he was talking about while the professor wisely blended into the background. I shall not be doing that. Yes, yes. Let's start with Throne of Eldritch. Cool. Is it fair for me to say this was a really popular set and one that people remember and has distinction to it and that people maybe walked away from enjoying on multiple levels? Draft was good. Standard was, well... Well, the Standard suffered from the problems that... Yeah, put forward. Draft was good. Because, yeah, yeah, I, I drafted it. I played in the pre-release set. That, that was my that was my one for loading ready one. I got to go to the pre-pre-release oh, for that, that and stuff. For yeah, and oh, like, okay. at the time, Oko wasn't even on anyone's radar. Someone opened it and no one was talking about it. Right. So it's a very fascinating little capsule of memory for me of like, oh, this is all exciting and cool. And then suddenly the Oko menace reared its head and became the most broken card possibly ever printed in Magic the Gathering. That's how severe it was. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this, I think the set is reflected on quite positively. I remember it quite positively. It's got a lasting effect even outside of bands though, because the power level was high, because we're coming off of War of the Spark and Horizon. We're in fire design at this point, yes. and power levels are pushed, right. to say the least. And I think that when you look at Zendikar Rising, what I think is very interesting is Zendikar is a plane that is considered, or I might say was considered, to be quite popular, mm -hmm. quite memorable. We've now revisited it, though. That was our third yep. return to the plane. And I think Zendikar Rising was a very much just passing through sort of set. This is a set I noticed, not talking about power levels of cards, but this is the set where they kind of, sort of, not really reprinted fetch lands. They didn't put them in packs. Mm -hmm. But I was really amazed at the fact that inside of uh, uh, booster boxes, you got a little packet that had a land in it, which could be a fetch land, yeah. or could be another needed reprint. I think Cavern of Souls was one of the options. Yeah, the the like Scars that. lands were in there, which at the time needed, as I think they still do, need a good reprint. And so I, I was actually noticing on my end, people don't seem to care that every box you buy, whether it draft or set, or in the case of collectors, it had two, will have a possible fetch land in it. That's not quite possibly getting two to three in every box like you would if they were at rare, but it is better odds than you would get of having a masterpiece. Sure, yeah, yeah. In it. And, and I find it with that, I don't think people really talk about that much with the set. I wonder if the set has kind of gone by and people don't talk about it much, because Zendikar's got a history, like a history of right. being not broken, but pushed in power level. Fetchlands, Cascade was originally, um, oh, that was Shards block. Yeah, I'm, Cascade I'm that, was Shards. I'm thinking that period of standard. I'm thinking that period of standard, because you played Fetch alongside Blood Brain Elf. Oh, Grandpa, um, <laughs> you're getting so old. But then but then we really get into it with um, Battle for Zendikar, where they, they pushed everything with um, the ridiculous Eldrazi and stuff. It's just got, it's got a history of powerful, powerful, well, Emrakul was in the original right. Zendikar block as well. So they've got a history of it. So I do wonder if they were cognizant of that, and they didn't want to do more super pushed stuff, so that Zendikar doesn't always be seen as a set that when it comes around, it breaks formats and they succeeded and that, that's the thing it's a success they didn't break multiple formats with the cards from Zendikar Rising like they did with the stuff from Front of Our Drain. And that is a good thing I don't think w was there any bands from Zendikar Rising yeah, we were trying to so look this up the, the funny and is, there's so many bands at that time. It's it so funny that it was a band so early on that uh, you kind of forget about it. So, so Omnath was banned within weeks in standard because right. it was broken I was playing in the streamer event that lots of streamers were doing, and it was broken on stream. Everyone was playing these ludicrous Omnath decks because you had powerful cards from Ikoria and stuff interacting with it as well. Fable Passages from Throne of Eldraine interacting with Lotus Cobra and so on. And Omnath was just card advantage, and it was insane. And they banned it within, what, I think less than two weeks of the set. It might have been, it might have been before the set was officially out in paper. Yes. It was out on Arena, but not on paper or something it, like that. I, I'm, it was very I'm almost positive uh, it was the latter where they saw from the early streaming mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. early Magic Online play indicators that Omnath was going to be a problem and they had already been getting such bad uh, reception to so many bands wrecking standard mm -hmm. and such that they decided to preemptively ban it 
I think pretty much starting day one, if not day one, week one. It was very early. It was very early. early. It, it was so powerful that it effectively banned the pre-streamer events because they kind of stopped doing them after this one. But that's probably another episode, another discussion. There is but, uh, a suspicion, <laughs> but I do think it's fair to note that there is a suspicion. We don't know this. I don't want to get... Yeah, I, yeah, I get yeah, yeah. Every time I do this, I get into a lot of trouble and I'm, I'm trying to watch it. We yeah. start speculating and, and such. But a lot of people said it's interesting that after that, they stopped doing the, yeah. the streamer early release. Releases. That's my speculation. It was ba it's bad optics that streamers were pushing and breaking things very early on, then they had a ban so early and stuff. But, we don't get to but discover was, anything. But that was the one thing from Zendikar. There are powerful cards in there, like Lotus Cobra, you know, small amount of play and stuff like that. Again, I'm more of a non-standard head. I'm a modern and legacy of course. head, of course. Right. But it's not like Throne, where we've had... Throne had multiple cards banned across multiple formats. Oko has been banned everywhere. Um, Once Upon a Time has been banned pretty much everywhere. Veil of Summer has been banned almost everywhere. Yeah. Like, it's crazy how powerful some of those cards were. And they also dominated standard up until now where we're talking about how the new sets are good, but everything is not good enough to uh, beat out Brazen Borrower and um, the, 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 the Stomp Giant that we struggled with the name of earlier. Um, Stone Crusher Giant. The cards are not bannable, but they're so powerful they push everything out of the format until they rotate. So the, the, the difference between Zendikar Rising and Throne is like night and day, honestly. It is, and what I really note about that is that it's sometimes hard for a new plane to resonate. Uh, an example I, I'm beating into the ground is uh, Kaldheim, where sure. I think Kaldheim did not resonate like like they would have wanted it to. Which is shocking and surprising because it's such a strong theme. Like right. Vikings is a popular thing. Uh, and yet, the fact that Zendikar, an established plane that is very popular, very memorable, did not resonate as well as Throne of Eldraine in terms of player reception, despite also having things such as not quite Re quasi reprints of fetch lands, a chance at a fetch land sure. that was a better chance than masterpieces. I think the optics simply maybe were mishandled. Maybe they should have just brought back masterpieces and said, but masterpieces were like one every two to three to four to five boxes, and here every box you've got a masterpiece that might be a fetch land, that, essentially. That's, that's a commentary on um, marketing and language use, right? Like, masterpieces is a thing that people understand and get hyped right. for, where box topper, uh, uh, buy box promo, all these words get muddled up, and it's very hard and confusing to know what does what. So that's an exercise in their marketing more so than what they did. Or perhaps, perhaps... The set itself was so ho-hum overall that even though it was revisiting a popular plane and even though they were literally putting a masterpiece in every box, it didn't make any difference because overall Zendikar Rising, when you strip those little nice things away, was a very middle-of-the-road set. And is that fair for me to say Zendikar Rising yeah, was middle-of-the-road? Yeah, I think so. It feels like an older set from back in the day where a set would come out and things would not affect Modern or Legacy in any way. Right. And players like myself would be like, cool, we'll draft it twice and then we just forget about it. Mm. Which was, for the last two years, has not been the case. Every standard set has absolutely upended every format possible. We're talking like War of the Spark and Throne of Eldraine doing that. Zendikar Rising was the opposite. Like, Om Omnath has seen some play in Modern because there's like an elemental deck that was born out of it. Right. But yeah, it's very much the standard sets of old where one or two cards creep in and then the rest of it is rather um, a non-event. So, yeah. And I've often pushed for that to a certain degree where I think that that's a safe way to do it. It allowed the older formats like Modern and Legacy not to have drastic upheavals within them. Yeah, they shouldn't rotate and some of these sets cause them to rotate essentially. Right, essentially. When, uh, well, and when, when Euro from yep. Theros and Oko were in every single deck and were doing all of this stuff, it, it was over the top. But even in a set like, and we'll get to things like Modern Horizons in a moment, where it causes that soft rotation. We maybe mm -hmm. should call it like a soft reboot. Yeah. You don't want that. But at the same time, you want a little bit of spice. You want a little bit of excitement. 100%. I've got, I've got an anecdote for this, right? So GP Prague is a legacy GP. The last one we had before mm -hmm. the, the, the world had its pandemic and everything. And I was like um, X and O or X and 1 for the first day. I was doing very well. Hadn't seen any new cards, really. Playing my old deck, playing older... Uh, Dreadhold Arcanist was the, the one I'd seen quite a bit in Delver. Okay. Day two, first round, I lose to Questing Beast, Oko, uh, Gilded Goose, and Once Upon a Time. Next round, I lose to Oko, Questing Beast, and the Bird. And I play against Questing Beast and Oko in another matchup in the next one. I just, I'm out, I'm dead in the, in the water. Mm -hmm. I get ruined by a, a, a basically a standard deck with duels and Force of Will it, and Brainstorm. It was crazy. They're playing all of those suites. And even to now, now Oko is gone. 
Questing Beast isn't as good because it's good at killing Planeswalkers. But the point is, that's four, five, six cards from, from Throne of Eldraine alone that transformed Legacy overnight and made my deck far worse because I couldn't play into those things. It's a rotation. It's not, nothing's rotating out like you have in Standard, but it's uh, new stuff coming that absolutely makes the old stuff obsolete. You've been too powerful or a complete metagame shift. And sometimes that's nice. Sometimes it's good to have a change up, but not a full on rotation where decks change drastically overnight. Yes. And this is my question to you, and it, it's some, maybe not a fair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is it possible to expect Wizards of the Coast to be able to make a set like Throne of Eldraine, but identify and not have, uh, as they were a actually released, cards like Oko, maybe Questing Beast, definitely Once Upon a Time, yeah. and and to say, look, if because we know hindsight's twenty twenty, we know after the fact that if Throne of Eldraine, Oko had been a little different, mm -hmm. maybe a lot different, uh, Once Upon a Time hadn't been in there. <laughs> Uh, and maybe, maybe Questing Beast, because it's in green, maybe the Stone Crusher Giant. I don't know about Stone Crusher. I, I don't want to get into yeah, the sure, of it, but sure, if, sure. if those, let's just say those three to four, there's 256 cards in the set, and everyone loved the set, and the set's great, and, and those three to four cards had just been taken down one yeah. to three notches, depending... There would have been, it would have been the greatest, it would have been original in a stride, the greatest set of yeah, all time sort of I, thing. I, I think you're right. Throne is very close to that. Like, if, if there was no Oko, no Once Upon a Time, and maybe no Velasum, it's three cards. Oh, no, Velasum was the core set before, sorry. Yes. Um, I've misspoke earlier. It's yes, a core yes. set before, yeah. Those two cards, and that, that's kind of the same package, right? But without, like, Oko and Once Upon a Time, I think that set is very reasonably power. It's on the upper to power level. Right. Like, you know, Questing Beast can be played in a certain metagame in Modern or Legacy, and um, Stone Crusher Giant and Brazen Bora become. Eternal format staples, as in in the same way like you know a, a certain removal spell is, but they're not dominating a format. That's yeah. probably where we want it to be. Right. It's about as exciting as you can get before it absolutely wrecks things. But again, uh, it's a weird example because I think Oko is probably one of the worst cards they've ever printed. It's it's really up there. It's in like the top top five easily. It's and crazy. Again, I'm I, I'm actually gonna. Put, I didn't say this to you before we filmed. I'm gonna put my foot down about the rumors about Oko and how that happened. Nonetheless, it happened. Mm -hmm. It happened. And is it fair for me to say they should have been able to prevent those mistakes? Because mis you cannot say that they can't make mistakes. These things happen. There's a huge history of magic bans. But Aaron mm. Forsyth once said in a famous article, if I could have my wish, we would never ban a card from standard. No, sure. no, not meaning that we'll let a card that needs to be banned stay like there, topic, yeah. but that we, we should not have any card that needs to ever be banned from standards. A it's, famous line, and the reason is, is when you bought, but there are people who bought a play set of Oko when it was 80, 90 bucks each, and then the next day it got banned. People who cracked it in the, it's, it's bad feels to have to ban yeah, from hugely, standard. Hugely. Ban from modern's another story, but ban from standard is the worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you gotta do it. Sometimes they're not doing it soon enough. Yeah, so the, this is that argument about like, would you rather they push the envelope, make a few mistakes and adjust, or would you rather they play it safe at all times? It is it's literally the, and the, the thesis of this whole discussion, right? Boring versus broken. Right. And I mean, you see it, I know our plan wasn't to talk about it, Corey, but I think it's a good example in comparing to Throne, where all the companions are really busted, mm -hmm. and once you remove them from the equation, Ikoria kind of just disappears from memory. There's yeah. hardly anything in it. Where Throne is a good example of once you remove the few broken elements, all the other cards are powerful and good and you want them. A great hen just something we haven't talked about for Commander. Like, there's so many good cards in that set. Yeah. So Ikoria, so Ikoria is the bad example of that, where the broken stuff is removed and the rest of it is boring. Uh, Throne is where they push the envelope. If they're just a little bit back, if Oka wasn't there, that set would probably be more... It would be the Innistrad, like you said. It would be... Question would be that, that Liliana or that Snapcast. Right. The cards that no one is like, that card is broken, but that card is fundamentally one of the best cards ever made, but it's not oppressive and upsetting. Right. So they're, they were so close. They were so that's, close. That's fun too. Like, as the modern legacy elders here, <laughs> it is fun when suddenly there is that one Snapcaster Mage or that one Liliana of the Veil, or I guess in that set, those two cards. But and Delver. And, that's, and, that set is crazy well, when you start is, to think about but it. But yeah. didn't, they didn't need to ban Delver in Legacy. No, or none modern. of these things got banned. These things and are the upper end of where they Interestingly to be. enough, while well, Delver decks, there was a period where Delver decks dominated modern. There was a period, I'm pretty sure, where they del dominated Legacy or were a very high right, deck. Right now, if we talk about Modern Horizon 2, right now. Right now, Delver it's up there. Is okay. There. And there was a period where Delver decks dominated Popper, but Right now, Delver is not dominating modern, mm -hmm. and there's been plenty of years of it not dominating modern, mm -hmm. uh, and it's fallen out of, like, Delver is not the powerhouse it once was in 
popper. Blue mm -hmm. still is because it's blue, but it, that actually says a lot that there there are are not. 30% of the meta Delver popper decks. Yeah, yeah. And so that, I think, it is a great card. It becomes a part of the magic culture. It becomes a part of the magic heritage, and it's like, this is where Delver of Secrets came from. I talked about how Delver being reprinted into Pioneer mm -hmm. might actually get a lot of people to give Pioneer another shot. And I'm not going to say, hey, I was right, but Pioneer has had more interest in it now than it has. In, and yes, I know, it was Pandemic and Pioneer isn't on Arena, but Pioneer is on Magic Online. And, and nobody was playing it on Magic but Online. There's an argument that Delver is what we're talking about. It's at the upper regions of being exciting and powerful, but not being busted and broken. Like, yeah. the, my sh strong belief is the problem is that in Legacy is brainstorming days, which is decades older than what Delver's <laughs> at, right? And that's a whole conversation there. Right. But Delver's just been printed to standard. It's now historic. And it's not ripping those formats apart because it's a powerful card when you have tools to utilize it, but it's not broken, broken. Right. And um, again, so Delver's a good example of that. If we do Innistrad blockers, we've gone way farther back than we planned to do, but Innistrad is a good example of that. Where it's not yes. busted, busted. It's the upper power level and it's exciting. And that's Zen what you kind of want. Zendikar Rising. What's memorable about the set? Scoot, uh, Swarm and... Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> and that's a middle of the, the road set in a lot yeah. of ways. And I, I really think that this might be, and here's my advocacy, this is advocacy for Watsi staff in a sense, and I've had a few. I don't. I don't want to like take up someone else's thing, but maybe we just need more people with higher pay and better hours. I don't know all these details. Sure, sure. Yes, mistakes will go through, but it seems like they were really pushing that fire design, really pushing that power, and and I know they were testing. They were test. Don't say they weren't testing. They test like crazy. Yeah. But maybe, I don't know the numbers. I've asked for the numbers and been told that we can't get them. But maybe if we have a this much percentage increase in the new products being designed and new cards being designed, people have put this up on the internet where they've said, compare how many new cards were in X year versus yeah, this yeah. year. Has R&D staff specifically increased to a, a to comparable amount, size, yeah. or is it like, well, there's two more people there than there were then? I don't know the answer, and I don't want to say that it hasn't, and I don't want to say they're not paid well, well we, and I don't want to yeah. say they're working slave hours or some horrible well, thing like that, but I do... keeping up with video games, aren't they? Like, yeah. Like, Arena and, and Magic in general is keeping up with video games in terms of release schedule. Meanwhile, video games like League of Legends or Hearthstone, you can have test realms, you can, you can adjust online and digitally. Magic doesn't have that privilege. It doesn't have beta testers in the same sense. There are right. play testers, but they're working on a much more finite, smaller teams than what video games get, where they get the entire swaths of the community can beta test for them in test realms. And right. Stuff. So it's unfair to make that, and people do make that comparison all the time. Yeah. They're like, oh, League isn't broken all the time. That's because the League can patch right. all the time. Right. And Magic can't, oh well, up until very recently. Up until very recently, but even so, there is the issue of paper, and there's also a huge issue in Magic with secrecy, which is that let's say they went, because these cards, they're working on cards today that are coming out in two years. Yeah. So let's say, so they've got the next three sets probably in the can or something like that. Let's say that they made it an effort and they somehow put them on Arena and had a closed circuit of even a hundred Magic players that would play with them. There's no way you'd prevent leaks. Yeah, There's, of it would be impossible. And, and you could sign the strictest "we will come to your house and drag you away" contracts of NDAs, and and as soon as you got the large enough amount of players that were given access to that, you just couldn't do it. And the problem it. you've got as well is a secondary market attached to Magic. Right. So th there are leaks in like the with Warhammer playtests and stuff all the time, but none of the models are worth the, what Magic cards are worth. Right. So the moment a thing comes out that breaks an old card, you know, like LED was a. Uh, uh, Lion's Eye Diamond was a drinks coaster at one point and is now a $600 card. Things like that happen overnight with Magic where cards spike because of new things coming out. If there's leaks, that information has a monetary value and it's just, right. it's impossible to manage. So they can't do that. They not, just can't do yeah. that. Not only that, but like uh, 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 a reprint, oh, well, it turns out they've reprinted oh, Fetchlands. The right, yeah, exactly. They've pr reprinted Fetchlands at Uncommon in it's the subsequent set. It's inside of training set. at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. This is literally inside of training at that point. So I don't, and I really want to be clear that this is not like I'm, I, I really dislike personally, it, it actually Actually, I, I do listen. I'm known for being very critical of Watsi, and I've got my issues with Watsi. I do, but what I really disagree with is when I see people saying, "Oh, could it have killed them to have play tested this set?" They were play testing it. Oh, could it have killed them to maybe read the cards before printing them? They, come on. But what concerns me is, 
hey, how big staff for this? Maybe we should have twice as many people there so that they could be working on it twice as long. There was a recent comment about how they can't test for, what was it, modern, right? Yeah. And, and stuff. Yeah. And they're like, how can you not test for, we don't have the people to test for modern. Popper was one where we got that comment where, where, where they said, because we had a lot of popper bands this year and that came up and the answer was we absolutely can't have people play testing for popper come on yeah. and i get that but i also wonder you're making a lot of money hire some more staff in there like I, and i know that's just like oh is that an easy solution you're throwing yeah. money at the solution yeah. but I, I would mean, really ask, let's go back 10 years and say, how big is the design team and play test team or whatever you want to encompass, is that R&D, is that play design, whatever you want to call it. How big is that particular bubble? Don't include artists and flavor people, but just the people making tiny. and testing the cards. How big is that? How many hours are put into that? And then say, how many more cards and formats are being looked at now? And how much has that bubble grown to compensate, and I really feel it hasn't. So this is a point I was going to make it later in the episode, but we've got to it now. So yeah. is that the for, the number of formats has grown as well? So we've got right. historic, you've got pioneer, uh, commander is bigger than ever, and obviously the, the design for that as well and things. And obviously as the as a number of formats have grown and the player base is growing, that team is not growing, and that's something they probably need to look at and uh, identify and admit to, right? Because that that is something they're not doing. What I will say though is that they can grow these teams and stuff, but there, there is evidently, and again, we're not, I don't want to get too into the weeds with this, but there's evidently, they make changes very late in development. The yeah. irony is, we've been designing this for two years, but we know that like, uh, Umazawa's Jitte, Jace the Mind Sculpt, all very famously broken cards, uh, Skull Clamp, are all broken because they were changed very late in development. And that is, again, gut feeling. Oko feels like that. It feels like it was a, we're going to change this from a minus one to a plus two or whatever. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not, we don't want to get we don't bogged know. down in that. But that late, there's the irony. Oh, we're playing two years ahead, but there's n there's no way in how these cards can get changed very late, and then they don't have the time to test. It's not on the testers at that point. It's on whoever's making the decision to change things very late. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. What a card, eh? What a card, eh? <laughs> what a card. Now we've got a set coming out literally in a day, and by the time you see this, it'll probably have been out for about two weeks. I'd say two to three weeks. So maybe it's crazy bands, but I'm willing to predict. From everything I've seen. We are, we are skirting the fire here, aren't we? If, we're skirting the fire. <laughs> I, I said I wouldn't make a prediction, but I'll say this. I, I think Crimson Vow is less powerful than Zendikar Rising. And I think it... Overall, yeah. yeah. I, ch I looked at these three and I say high, medium, low. And there's nothing wrong with low, but sometimes, you know, that low flow doesn't quite get you where you want to go. I mean, it's, it, I think going down in power level is fine if your theme is on point and you've got a set that's exciting for other reasons. And Innistrad used to be that reason. Some people say they're fatigued by Innistrad, right? Because we've been back. Uh, this would be the, I can the seventh that. set on Innistrad. Yeah, me too. I think two in a row was rough considering... Uh, I'm a big fan of two blocks, but that's a whole different episode. But yeah, there, there's a fatigue there. So if theme and flavor is on point, the power level doesn't have to be too high. And I'm, I'm, I hate agreeing with you, Brian, but I think, yeah, the power level isn't that high. There may be one or two cards that might show up in yeah. combo decks and older formats and stuff, but nothing's going to get banned out of this. And that's that's my hot take. That's your hot take. Yeah, nothing's going to get banned word. out of this, certainly not in standard, which again, then is going into that Aaron Forsyth quote about, it, uh, if you know, I don't want to ever ban anything out of standard because there's just so much that, that that's wrong. We shouldn't have had something that needs to be banned to begin with. But is the solution to Throne of Eldraine, Crimson Val? I don't think so. I think no. what that is, is we don't know, or they do know, we, the public, don't know how mistakes like Oko and Once Upon a Time, et cetera, et cetera, came to print. We don't know. Maybe they know, maybe they don't. Maybe mistakes just happen, but is the solution, if we just set the power level so low that even mistakes can't be that impactful? Because they do try and keep the power level of the set very consistent, so we're doing a high power set, we've got a bigger chance of a problem. So if we do a low power set, even a problem that in that set maybe for draft or whatever, it's like, oh, you draft this card, you're gonna just dominate. But that is not really gonna hit a lot of people's radars. And I think that the goal should be we want to make Throne of Eldraine without the problem cards. Yeah, that, I that, think that, that should be the goal. That should every be the set. Yeah. We've said in previous, we did a joke episode that you probably didn't watch, or if you watched it, you hated it, because a lot of people didn't get the joke. But we called it, What's Ruining Magic Today? And we presented countering, contrasting things. And one of the jokes was, what's ruining magic today? Power creep. And we talked about why power creep is ruining, mag ruining magic. And then we said, what else is ruining magic today? 
underpowered cards, low power cards, low power sets. Fine, you're, you're telling them how we're taking a joke from an episode a year ago and we've just compounded it into a full episode now. Yes. You're, this is how sausage is made. You're revealing behind the curtain. This is how we've conceptualized the, the episode. The point is, is, that, is that both of these things are problematic. Yeah. But I would much rather, I think, I would much rather be getting Throne of Eldraine sets than Crimson Vow sets. Yeah, like... I'd rather they took chances and made mistakes and had to rectify them than never, ever push the envelope, right? No, but I then, disagree with that. But, well, well, but how would you get to the Throne of Drain level if you're not trying to push the envelope? Because those cards, the upper end of those cards, do push the envelope, and some of them were just, like, outside of the envelope by, like, a mile. I think they have to figure out how they can catch it. I think okay, they have to. Okay, so you're going to. back to, like, hiring a, a, boat more, a boatload more staff, essentially. No, that's just, I'm, I, I don't know what I'm talking about in the regard of, like... <laughs> <laughs> in the regard, you don't laugh before I said, in not, the regard of, of I don't know, their policy system staffing. For all I know, I'm going to get a really angry DM from someone at WotC saying, actually, you know, our staff in this has, has tripled or what. I, I don't know. That, that's not the point. I, I'm, I'm talking, I am capable of identifying a problem without necessarily knowing the solution, but that doesn't mean I can't identify the problem. I don't know the solution, but I don't like when people say what you just said, actually. Why? Because it's saying we're going to accept a bad state of the game in order to get a good thing well, in the no, game. no, no, because I'm, I'm not saying that they need to do it. Oko was a problem. Of course it was. So I'm not saying they have to do it all the time, because that was the problem that we had. We had two years of absolute pushing and sometimes it wasn't even pushing like like companions was so outside the realms of a pushed envelope it was a different game they were just kind of a different game and it was bad and it because lurus is the other one alongside oko yeah, yeah. one of the worst things ever printed it oh was, yeah it was insane so that's not envelope pushing that's just i would say companion was borderline madness and it was but, and it was it's exactly a symptom of of i'm sorry to cut you off but it's on. just i feel very strongly about this one companion is a symptom of they had it was from everything i've read uh, uh, I mean, well, look, I love Mark Rosewater, but he literally said Companion was my fault and it was my, my design and my mechanic and I pushed for it. And it's called, you need this thing to be going through, not just one person. It's like, let's make Commander st standard into Commander. Won't this be fun? You need a team on that. You need yeah. a huge, devoted, we team on this. And if you go, we don't have the... Uh, work power or the workforce, I say you're making money hand yeah. over so, fist, hire some more freaking with, people. With Lewis and Oko, they're good examples of how this doesn't really hold up that they couldn't test it. Because I did a video on this where I, my, my, my thesis was no one knew Oko was coming and we know it after the fact, right. same with hindsight. And then when I went back and I, on video, showed the Reddit threads and the forum threads, like everyone saw it within seconds. People were yeah. like, this is mad, what are you doing? So there is this argument that things are getting changed very late in development, or they're not pushing the envelope, they're just, they're just breaking the envelope open and just going absolutely wild with yeah. it. Companion and Oko are that. And I'm not saying we need that. I'm saying that you can push the power level of stuff and have mistakes sometimes. Omnath is probably a good example of that. Yeah, Omnath, Omnath is didn't a good example. break everything, but he needs, it, well, there's an argument he might not need to be banned in the standard, but that's where we want to be. So I'm not saying that everything has to be pushed constantly. And I think they're learning that because... Let's be real, Magic has grown during the pandemic. It is doing incredibly well. It is. No one is drafting. Standard is only played on Arena. Uh, Commander is the biggest thing ever. They can sell packs hand over fist with just nice arts and cool legendaries. They don't actually need to have Okos anymore. There was a period in time when they probably... There's quotes, isn't there, that competitive uh, um, demand would push pack, pack sales. I don't know if that's true anymore, mm. honestly. It's Commander, right? So maybe they're slowly realising that having extremely pushed stuff to uh, either get the player base talking, have discourse, or sell packs isn't even necessary. So what I'm saying is push the power level, get to your thrones, but don't change things late in development and do not do Companion. Because Companion was immediately like i saw lurus and i was like what and then you just yeah you see it next to black lotus and you immediately realize what is going on how is this even this is not a testing thing this is just a you you just know if you've played yeah to yeah. me there's a difference between innovation and gimmick and and i felt yeah. companion is is why you don't do gimmick and and i will to my i am sorry like 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 Mark could walk in here right now and say he needs to sit me down and have a face-to-face -face talk about why I'm wrong about this. And I'd, I'll accept that, but I still have it ingrained in me that that companion was commander is popular. Let's bring commander to standard. And and I, I just it, I, it cannot see it any other way. And I think there should be red lights flashing if that's what your pitch. There should just be red lights flashing. That is gimmick, not innovation. Yeah, and it, 
and it needs to be caught. So there's people make mistakes. And it's okay to make mistakes, right? right? We put out videos that bomb all the time. Sure. Or you can get things wrong in videos. I do it quite often. I accidentally made a play mistake where I basically cheated in a gameplay video the other day. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know how I missed that. It happens, right? Yeah. But when you are backed by supposedly a team that can help you and money to hire more team members or making close to a, a billion dollars in profit or whatever it is, then there's this argument that you can make mistakes, but as a as a whole cohesive factory that pumps this thing out at the end, someone needs to catch it somewhere, right? Yeah. Someone needs to go, this is bad optics, this is not right, don't say that, don't do this. Or in this case, companion is literally ludicrous and should never have happened. Right. So yeah, there's a very big difference between pushed power level of even the Eldrazi of Battle for Zendikar. That's what we're talking about. All things that were broken and gross right. are nothing compared to Companion and no. Oko. So there's a difference between that. So I get what you mean. I don't think you can use an excuse to just do whatever you want and fix it with a ban. That's wrong. And that hurts people's wallets. Right. We're okay to sit here. It's exciting to have bannable cards to talk about and play in a video that I can play and get loads of views and then it gets banned. I'm okay. But your average player, like you said, buying an Oko playset for $90 a pop per card, that's harsh. That's not okay. Yeah. It's not okay. But I also think it's not okay. So we're also in the middle now of Innistrad. And because I say, when I say middle, it's because we're getting another Innistrad set in January, which is just these two sets again. Because the, the, the thing, back end of it is the same thing, just drawn out. But yeah, it yes, is the middle. Yeah, It yeah. is the middle. Double feature and, and the thing is, is that these sets are so, so low power. And yeah. I, they're just... They're really kind of meh. But they, we kind I, of I, need that because we have such a... He oh, sorry. By we, I'm talking yes. for a very specific place here of Modern Legacy, Commander to an extent as well, because we have so many supplemental sets that absolutely bombard us with ludicrous things because Modern Horizons and Modern Horizon 2 have been insane. Right. It's nice to have a breather. It's nice to have a three-month window where the sets are underpowered and one card makes it into Modern or whatever. It, is, Not talking is from it, a standard perspective, though. Is it, though? Is it? I feel that what good. we've got... I feel that what we've got is when you look at Modern Horizons and Commander Legends, you are taking a lot of the stuff that used to just be in $4 booster packs, extracting it from the $4 booster packs, putting it into the $25 booster packs, and now what's in the $4 booster packs is just water. And That's interesting, because is that where the power is going flavor, as well? All the flavor. Like, yeah. We had fire design for, for two years of like, even the standard sets were crazy. Water the spark in front of a drink, absolutely crazy. And now we're getting down into the, it's always waxing and waning power levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think they're doing that not only with the fancy foil treatments and stuff and the more expensive packs, do you think the power level and the power creep is moving to the premium product? So I hadn't ever even put the two together. I never yeah. thought maybe they're charging us more for power creep. Well, I think it was around Strixhaven, which we haven't mentioned yet, that I noticed. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. We haven't even talked about it. <laughs> Strixhaven is where I noticed that they were easing off the, 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 the pushed power, even though we had already had uh, Kaldheim and Zendikar. But it mm. was for Strixhaven. I think it was because everybody was expecting Strixhaven, given the theme and the setting, to affect the design of the cards. Hmm. When in fact, Strixhaven was another, if it hadn't been for Mystical Archives, Strixhaven mm -hmm. would have probably been considered a bit of a disaster set. Yeah. Uh, and well, there's an argument that, that there's an argument I've seen, I don't know if I yeah. agree with it, and I see it, how do you agree with this? That because the premise is so strong, because of the popularity of Harry Potter and right. mystical schools and stuff, they don't necessarily need to sell it via chase rares and bombs. They can sell it off the back of the premise almost, because casuals will buy in. Right. Obviously, Mystical Archive is the other the other character. How do you feel about that I, suggestion? I wonder. I don't think so. And again, we're doing exactly what I didn't want to do, which is to speculate things. <laughs> what I more meant is that, like, given the setup, it's a it's a it's a mystical setting of a school of of magic. It uh, it's got a history. They they've got knowledge in their archives of powerful spells and stuff. And also that we're doing Ravnica, uh, 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 two color houses, guilds sort of thing. Mm -hmm. that, that has everything on the table in description to be a very uh, 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 evocative, powerful design yeah. set. And I think that things are getting divorced from that in all honesty. I don't feel like I'm back in Innistrad in Crimson Vow. I feel like I'm at a meme wedding. I really do, and I don't mean to be mean to somebody who is enjoying this, but as I'm reading Innistrad cards that are called like You're Invited or Boring Guest or whatever it is, I'm like, wait a second. I get that the plot is that there's a marriage between Olivia and Edgar. I don't get why I care or what the effects or ramifications are, and I don't even know if the sun came back or not. read the short stories, I think, on the website. Right? I've read them. They don't impact with me okay. anymore. Okay. Uh, but there's just such a like... Oh, what happens at a wedding? 
and, and the cards are, what happens at a wedding but with vampires? It's an invitation. It's an engagement ring. It's yeah. a party snacks. And I feel that it's like Innistrad had this such a, a richer, more complex tapestry in those areas. And I feel, again, when you bring up this idea that it's been taken out for the sets, I feel that if, if Commander Legends Baldur's Gate had been Commander Legends Innistrad and we hadn't returned to Innistrad, I don't think they would have done wedding jokes. I think they would have been like diving a lot deeper into the things about Innistrad that defined the first one. In a lot of ways, I think the original Innistrad block was Star Trek The Next Generation, The Best of Both Worlds, Part One. Okay. The return to Innistrad with uh, 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 Eldrick Moon was Star Trek The Next Generation, The Best of Both Worlds, Part Two. It was good, but it wasn't as good as the first part. It didn't, it was, it was, it was a good enough conclusion with some very good highlights, that second part, but not as good as part one. And now with Midnight Hunt and Crimson Vow, we're just into the last three years of Voyager. Where it's just Borg, 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 Borg. And it's just like, yeah, it's the Borg, but they're in every episode and it's kind of lost. And now it's just when I'm looking at some of these cards. I, I would agree with you about Crimson Vow. Yeah. Like, I think that's a bit unfair to Midnight Hunt because I think there was a natural progression between Innistrad blocks. We're getting really into weeds about Innistrad themes here, but you know, it's yeah. our podcast. We can do what we want, I guess. Uh, Innistrad was fantastic. I really like the fact that the natural progression was to go to body horror and eldritch space monster horror, like the, the Lovecraftian thing. It feels like a natural place to go. Not progression necessarily, but like a, a path to take. Mm -hmm. And then we get Midnight Hunt. I did a whole video talking about folk. I, I wish that was more of a theme of the set. And yeah. I didn't really, really dive into that. You did a what? I did a, I did a, an, a video on a YouTube channel. that is. You have a YouTube page. channel that anyway, people should go like and subscribe and watch. You should go check out the folk essay video. They're I'm not really going proud of to. That. Anyway, the, <laughs> they're not going to go The, folk, watch the it. folk video I was really proud of. Anyway, uh, that theme I thought was interesting. The sundial, the sun, all this sort of stuff. And then we hit Crimson Vow, which was a set that I was really not excited for when I heard about when yeah. I thought this is kind of a it's a meme, right? Right. And we have this thing in Magic where you you jump from plane to plane. It's gimmicks essentially. Yeah. You said not to gimmick earlier, but it is a gimmick. This plane is uh, Gothic horror. This plane is ancient Egypt. This plane is Greece. It's uh, ancient Greece. It's all gimmicks essentially. And we've got this, this sort of these plot points fit in this round where we're going through the horror tropes, and then we just suddenly hit like wedding as a gimmick. <laughs> yeah. Which imagine if it wasn't in Australia. Imagine we just went to a random fantasy world and we were in a wedding. Can you imagine how badly the community would have reacted to yeah. wedding the set? Wedding the set. Which I, is what this it, is, yeah. but with vampires. Yeah. So, yeah, I get what you're saying. It does feel cartoonish. It does feel caricatured. It does. It does. And I do think the art direction, the world building, and like Olivia's dress and stuff, they've done fun. People who are doing the art direction have done phenomenal jobs of making me care more than I thought I would. Right. But I do agree. I never thought we'd have a wrath come into standard that is themed around wedding guests. Yeah. If you told me that two years ago, I would have said, no, Magic wouldn't do that. But here we are, and it's not as bad as perhaps I would have perceived if you told me two years ago, but I, I see what you mean. Crimson Vow is a very weird, tonal, gimmicky, caricature shift Right. all the others, including Midnight Hunt. I think it's a bit unfair to Midnight Hunt to, to level it in, although obviously they're, they're being lumped together in, in, in on This is the connection I see. You feel we're getting a little off track here, but this is the connection I see. Even though, if you, I think Throne of Eldraine was the was was possibly the first in person one we did together. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. Was our first in person. It was either our first Maybe. in or person. Our I think it was our first in person yeah. one was Throne of Eldraine. And in that video, if you go back and watch it, I felt disappointed in aspects of the uh, flavor of the world. Yeah, I remember that. I, I remember did this. because I didn't like. This. I felt. I was it in was, that chair and I was defensive. You were. You were. But this is what I'll say. There was a there was a level of of uh, uh, thought and care and and taking itself seriously that was put into it. And even though I disagreed and I said I really wish they hadn't done Monty Python the card yeah, a few jokes was one of my big one. A few said, right? jokes landed flat. Yeah. And I did like I did like the story and I did know what was going on in the story and I I, I was still invested in the story of Throne of Eldraine. I was actually on the outs on that. A lot of people did not like the, the, the e-book and I actually thought it was very well done. Mm. And the thing is, is that as the card design lowers in a parallel to that, so too is let's make this set resonate. Let's make this set hit. And I know that was their goal with Throne of Eldraine is they're like, we want Arthurian legend to meet the, the, the fairy tales of old and that they really dove into that. And then this is, wouldn't it be funny if it was a wedding? And, and it's, it's so, when I'm, some of these cards, they're spells. 
and and it's you read the titles of these cards and it's like this is supposed to be a magic spell and it's like just something you do at a wedding it's i guess it is the logical extreme but too far kind of like pushing power level in a way of top down design right right it was before like here's a horror thing with a top down with a top down this is wedding top down so what does a wedding cake look like in magic card form right it's such an extreme parody of top down design right the idea of top down design for those who don't know is you come up with a, a flavorful concept and then you build the mechanics underneath it to 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 realize that and that's what innistrad was famously one of the early ones to really get into that Crimson Vow is the extreme of that, where they picked a wedding of all things to do it with. Yes. So I think you're, I think you're, I think you're right. It's, it's, it's kind of parallel. It's that power level push of. Right. And this extremes. is, and then when it goes back into, so what do you want? So this whole video is, would you rather have uh, uh, pushed but broken, or uh, or or mm -hmm. safe but boring? And I feel in a lot of ways, wedding the set is safe but boring, because it, it, it's called. Here's why it's safe, because it's on Innistrad. Oh, it's on Innistrad. Yeah. People will buy it because it's on Innistrad. What was Zendikar? It's Zendikar. We put fetch lands in it. It's, it. We'll put one fetch land in every box. It's fine. And it turns out it's not fine. And that's my point. It turns out that you put a masterpiece in every box and you just put it on Innistrad and it's not fine. Because what we need is for every set to be a home run. Now, every set can't be a home run. But we want to look not to make excuses of, oh, because I feel like there are going to be some mailbag columns where somebody's going to say, the thing is, is we do have to power down, and then we'll go back up, and then we power down, and this is how it works. And I say, no, 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 you're making excuses for that. It should, there shouldn't be forgettable sets. There shouldn't be broken sets. It should be original Innistrad every time. It should be original Zendikar every time. It should be original Ravnica every time. And we don't just say, oh, well, if you push it, you're going to have cards that need to be banned. I disagree with that either or. Uh, it shouldn't be, well, if it's on Innistrad, sometimes we'll just be silly and make it a wedding. And you, you'll get, people are getting bored with Innistrad. No, it should be, if it's on Innistrad, we take this as seriously as we did creating Innistrad. Sure, There's I, no yeah. way you can tell me they took Crimson Vow seriously. No, and I agree with you on that. I still, I still disagree on the whole, yeah. the pushing for breaking. Yeah, the, I mean, it's going to happen. I'm not saying you can yeah, never have a mistake. Yeah, and there's a amount of space as well. Like, when we go back and look at Ravnica and Innistrad, we go, if we go back to Ravnica and Mirrodin, we're going back so far that, like, magic is relatively young, right? Like, we're right. getting to this point where we're so far from Mirrodin and we're almost as far from Mirrodin was from the beginning of Magic. We're going to get mm -hmm. to that point. Yeah. So the sp space dries up. Everything is kicker. All mechanics are just kicker. Everything is kicker. They've <laughs> got to find new space to explore. So I'm okay for them to push. So I, so I disagree with them, but I definitely agree that, yeah, there's a gimmick. It, 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 every set's a gimmick, but what Crimson Vow is maybe the most gimmicky set we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Is it, I mean, you, I think you might have said that about Throne originally, and now Throne pales in comparison to this. I, I've rewatched that particular episode a lot of times because I was very, because there was so much that I did like, and I even said it in that episode, and in that episode I said, I like the set and the cards a lot. It, God, I almost think that Monty Python card pushed me over the edge. It was that, uh, you know, and yeah. and and uh, there, I can't even well, right they're now. The, they're the cards that are forgettable. No one remembers that stuff. <laughs> I guess if it was broken, people would remember. But like Emery, which is the Lady of the Lock and all that sort of stuff. I liked things, it. I fantastic, liked it. awesome. People remember that stuff. I guess that's so that to me with with Eldraine was what bothered me was I wanted every card to be like like in flavor, like Emery, and that was much more like Seven Dwarves. And yeah. it was a little like, I like oh, seven doors. but on. yeah, that's yeah. that's a subjective thing. I, I just felt like, and, and maybe, and you said it in the episode too that maybe it's just Disney has ruined us, and 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 it's like yeah. you're not mad at R and D, Brian. You're just mad at yeah. Disney. Yeah, and it, it, maybe I am. Uh, and yeah, hindsight's twenty twenty. But you can't blame Disney for being like, wedding ring is a weird thematic concern for a magical wizard battle game. It's it's. <laughs> I thought I thought. It I think was, that card's cool, by the way. I think it's right. a cool design. But it is, it is a weird place to be. You know be. what's weird about it to me is that they didn't say, they didn't call it such that something such as binding signet. Uh, yeah. A, 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 a mancer's Vampiomancer's ring. And that it says, with this ring, Olivia bound herself to, to Ed, 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 yeah, Ed, Ed, Edgar yeah, yeah. in more ways than so, one. And you see it, it's just... Wedding ring. So you build it with you build it with art. You build it with art direction. You build it with flavor text. You build you build the world. The art's a, lovely. A much on it. more a tapestry as opposed to uh, you write down wedding ring and then you don't change that. Right. It's design. like well, wait a minute. It's not wedding ring. It's a magical ring. It's a signet. It's it's uh, uh, what and is she doing something with it? Is she is there something where when he puts it on he'll be you know I, locked in? I do in. wonder if someone wrote wedding ring very early in design because they they normally have quite normal names right and then later on they flavor them up as the set gets built. I, w I wonder if wedding ring made it from beginning of design to end of design. I can just. Just see a the meeting. I'm so sorry to. I'm. 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 
this is why everyone at Watsi hates me, but like, I can just see the thing. Oh, what do you get at a wedding? A wedding ring, yeah. Invitation, yeah. Guests that are boring, yeah. Guests that are happy. Oh, you put on your fancy clothes. Oh, what if we had one transform? They literally have a transform card where it's just like, oh, now the transform card is there at the wedding and they're dressed up. That's what you do at a wedding. And it just feels so gut. Well, we gotta move, but this is also where I get into. So before you hate me, Watsi, lone Watsi person who's still watching, uh, uh, that I'm attacking your work ethic or whatever, this is where we get into why we need more time to develop more breath and more employees and things like that. Is. Because it's just called, we gotta get out, we got 18 more commander decks coming. We're going to the, we're going to, you know, like, like what's the next I'll, realm we're going I'll to? I'll tell you The what, realm of, of lights. Gangsters, gangsters. Gang next. Oh, right, well, gangsters. I'm, I'm scared now. What do gangsters have, Vince? What no, do gangsters have? No, no, this is what have? I'm gonna say. Hats. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, There's uh, gonna be a uh, fedora. So, I'm scared now, because I was excited for New Capan. I was like, detective fiction, noir, pulp fiction. Right. This is gonna be interesting if they do it right. I'm very scared that Tommy Gun has made it from uh, development to end right. the name Tommy Gun. Right. That is a that is a fear. I that's guarantee a fear now. you, we're, I'm calling it now. New Capenna. Tommy it, Gun. No, no, no. I'm gonna say Fedora? it's gonna be like it'll be literally called Gangster's Hat. Gangster's Hat. <laughs> it can't be. Don't do this to me. Don't do they this literally to me. have wedding ring. If a year ago I said Vince, I'm calling it now. They're literally gonna have a card, and it's just called Wedding Ring. You would go, <laughs> it can't be. It can't be. Don't do this to me. You would literally. A year ago, have done that, right? Yeah, yeah. And so they're going to have gangsters the set, hat. The set gangsters is half and hat. half. The set is half and half with Crimson Val because because the, the wrath is I forget the name of it now, but it's themed the way that it's flavorful. Where wedding ring and invitation, are, the, the, it is half and half. It's half of what you'd expect and half of what you'd not. But yeah, I'm it'll scared. either be gangsters hat or gangsters suit or something like that. Oh no, there's going to be a suit. Have you seen his armor? Like, but like I just mean like they're just going to call it. Oh no, I'm with you. And there's also going to be. <sighs> Wizard's revolver. Bosses. Wizard's Wizard's Tommy gun. This is magical Tommy gun. Right. Magical Tommy gun. That's what it was at the beginning of the development. Right. And somehow it didn't get a new name by the end. Um, They're gonna accidentally make a card called Boss's Orders and not realize that there's a Pokemon Team Rocket card. We should go through all the Pokemon cards that are Team Rocket cards and just say these will be magic cards. Um, this is interesting. You've got you've got our Crimson Row review episode here. You've got our Nuka Panda prediction video, all captured up into our uh, Would you want broken or boring? Yes. So you, I guess we're landing on, I want a little bit broken, and you want... Perfection. That's not a, that's not a, you can't just say that. Comment section, please. I don't. Please berate him for I, that. I, I, I expect perfection in all things, Vince. You perfection know that about is momentary. Me. It cannot exist forever, Brian. Well, I feel I have the perfect co-host. We've already had perfection. We had Mavrika Block, we had Meriden. Okay. We're years later, perfection is gone. So we're after the party and just... Yeah, we, we are, we are... Yeah, we're postmodern magic now. Everything's a mess. Everything's deconstructed. This is called. This is if this was if if Magic: The Gathering, the game, were a card in Crimson Vow, it would be called After the Party, and it would just be the room trashed. No, that, that was that's like, too not on the nose. It needs to be formerly great game or something. No, no, no. no. <laughs> you're, Former, you're, uh, 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 the but that's party the, that's has too the harsh. party has died down. The car, the party has died yeah, down. Yeah. But it's like it was a great party, and now it's like yeah, there's still some booze over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bit <laughs> and by booze, we mean Modern Horizons too. Yeah, that's the exciting bit.